small group discussion as well as Q&A. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much for being here. Really excited to have you. Thanks. Okay. Yep. okay. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today. And let's get started. So yeah, so I just started in the School of Planning. I have a PhD in Public Health from the University of Alberta. Um, and I'm excited to be here because in public health, we think everyone cares about health as much as we do, which is actually not true, I'm discovering. Um, so it's exciting for me to be here so I can tell you about how we think about food systems in public health, which may be different or some, in some ways the same as how you've been thinking about food systems. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about eating behaviors and food environments. And these slides will be posted on Learn. Plus, they're mostly pictures, so you may want to write notes or maybe not. All right, so here is, you've, you've seen this model before. Stephanie said she flashed it up at one point earlier this term, sustainable local food system. So you have all these different elements of, uh, of a food system that ultimately result in, this is where I sort of study, whoops, here at access, so where are people accessing their food, and also consumption. And consumption obviously has a lot of implications for many different socially valid outcomes, including nutrition, but also including other things like sustainability, uh, as you've heard in some of your reading, or as you've read in some of your readings today. So this is where I'm going to be focusing, of all the many things you'll be covering in this course, I'll be focusing on access and consumption. So what am I talking about when I talk about the food environment? Very briefly, the food environment is access to retail cues that influence our food purchasing. So I'm specifically talking about retail food environments. So places where people go to buy food. So this can be in stores where over 70 cents of every dollar in Canada on food is spent in stores as opposed to restaurants. That proportion is slowly decreasing. Um, over time, people are buying more and more of their food at places that prepare food, uh, like restaurants, fast food outlets, um, convenience stores, etc. Um, but ultimate, and this also lower the lower income you have, the greater the proportion of your food dollar is spent at stores as opposed to restaurants. So, what are some of the the access? To, what are some of the retail cues that I'm talking about? So, in public health, okay, first let's stop and ask the question. So, I asked Stephanie uh, for last week to ask you guys about what food cues in your environment stand out to you. So. Thinking about where you are in your daily routine, in your weekly routine, where did you see food this week? At what kinds of outlets? Yeah. Okay, grocery store. Yep. Did anyone see food this week? Yeah. Coffee shops. Coffee shops. Farmer's market? Okay, so so far we've heard about three sort of typical places you would expect to see food. Did anyone see food in an atypical spot? Yeah? I saw food in a bar. Food in a bar, where you would expect to see mainly alcohol. Yeah. Yep. Where else did you see food this week being marketed to you? Yeah? Um, there's like this new billboard thing in the SLC that's like an advertisement for Swiss Chalet. It's really huge and, I don't know, that kind of threw me off. Where is it? Um, it's like just by the bubble tea, if you're walking toward the uh, atrium. Okay. Or toward the bar, yeah. Okay, so you're seeing like advertisements outside of actual, like, so Swiss Chalet is not on campus. It's not here, no. So they're it's telling just... students to go to Swiss Chalet. Apparently, I guess. Okay, yep. Um, there's actually also one of those in the gym. In the gym? Yeah. For Swiss Chalet? Yeah. Which is totally random. Okay, interesting. Where in the gym is it? It's like right on the, um, I guess, uh, core like area. It's right on the wall. Like okay. Where people do like core exercises. Oh, okay. So you're like, do some crunches and then come eat like a bunch of fat, <laughs> fat chicken. <laughs> nice. Did anyone go to a library this week? Was there food in the library? Yes. Did anyone go? Probably not, because you might not be living at home and needing to fix things. Hardware store? Next time you go into a hardware store, see if they sell food by the counter, because they probably do. Um, where else have I seen food recently? Anyway, okay, so think about like places that maybe 20 years ago you would not have seen 
when you were like in diapers, you would not have seen food. Yeah. Um, they sell food now at Staples. At Staples? Yeah. Okay. Staples? Yeah. Why do you need food when you're in Staples? I don't know. Because you get hungry buying paper. Yeah. I remember last, uh, I think it was July 1st, it's one of those holidays when everything else is closed and Shoppers Drug Mart was open and so many people were in there buying chips and soft drinks. And <laughs> yes. So pharmacies now, and interestingly, uh, for larger chain pharmacies like Shoppers and uh, Rexall and Pharma Plus, they make almost as much money now from their front of store sales as they do from the pharmaceutical sales in the back of the store. That's not the case for smaller or independently owned pharmacies, but for the big ones. And Shoppers, you may know Shoppers was recently bought by Loblaws. And a friend of mine who I work closely with on a lot of things ran into Galen Weston, who is like the head honcho of Loblaws, <laughs> in the flagship Loblaws store in downtown Toronto and told him about some of the work we do with healthy corner stores and that kind of thing. And he said that, um, Galen said that, we're trying to get more food, more healthy food into shoppers. The problem is the distribution trucks are so huge they can't necessarily na navigate down the small roads where shoppers are or fit in the parking lots to unload some of this, the, the bigger um, items. And so that's part of the reason why there's not quite as much fresh food yet in, farm, in shoppers, but that's changing over time. Um, so yeah, so pharmacies now sell tons of food. Okay, and so this, so this, this, I wanted to ask you this because I wanted you to be aware of the places where you're being marketed food in your environments, whether it's through billboards, on the radio, on, um, in your social media feeds, all the places where you're experiencing food companies trying to get you to buy their products. Okay, so <coughs> this is a picture of a robot and a zombie, and when we think about how people navigate their retail food environments and how people decide to purchase what foods they're purchasing and then to consume whatever of those foods that they purchase. The question is, do consumers behave like robots in grocery stores? Let's just use grocery stores as an example. Or do they behave like zombies? And what I mean to say by that is, are we completely rational decision-making creatures as a robot would be, or do we just blindly follow cues in our retail food environment that lead us to purchase the things that we want to purchase? So, if you look at consumers as robots, you're thinking that there's these rational decisions to eat healthy foods for long-term payoffs, because we all know that eating fruits and vegetables, reducing consumption of smoked meats and nitrates, eating a healthy diet will prevent long-term disease and disability related to um, poor nutrition over our life course. On the other hand, there's all of these things in our, in our environments that are influencing us to buy <coughs> the things that are there. So things like, so this is the, zombies are like the ones who don't eat the healthy stuff because they're just mindlessly led by these cues in their retail food environment. So what are the cues in the retail food environment? First of all, there's billions of dollars spent on marketing of typically less healthy foods. Less healthy foods, when you add salt and fat and sugar to things, they're tastier. And we're biologically designed to seek out sources of salt, sugar, and fat um, because that's what has helped us evolve over time as a species. There's cultural practices. So it's not just, um, it's not, you may just choose automatically go for something because that's what your parents did growing up or that's what your the people who, in your, in your culture, that this is the foods that we eat. Easy access. Unhealthy foods are so easy to access, as we've already talked about. They're everywhere. Everywhere you go now has food, almost everywhere. And often they're very quick and convenient. So when you think about the work that, it requi that you're required to do to eat an apple, and your hand might get dirty and you might need to wipe your face, and then you have an apple core that you may or may not want to eat, and then where do you throw that? So think about all of those things. And you don't want to just stuff it in your pocket or in your backpack because it's gross and moist. Compared to eating a chocolate bar, which you can just rip, you have a little bit of garbage, but you can stuff it in your pocket, it doesn't really matter. And it's tasty and quick and very convenient. So here we are, the grocery shoppers, somewhere in the middle. What kind of stakeholders in society do you think like to promote this view that consumers are completely rational it is their choice what they buy and what they consume. What kind of stakeholders? Like, who would be interested in 
getting this message out there to the public. If you eat a crappy diet, it's your own fault. You need to be educated and this kind of thing. Yes. So the food industry has a huge vested interest in promoting this view. Consumers, everybody knows that there's healthy foods and less, and, and fun foods. They don't even call them unhealthy, they call them fun foods. Um, so it's your choice as a consumer to make these rational decisions. On the other hand, often you have public health people saying, no, 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 we need more restrictions, more regulation, more policies aimed at supporting consumers' ability to make healthy food choices because they do act more like zombies in these kinds of situations. So we have a tension not only with how these views are uh, portrayed, but also who's sort of advocating these views. So different cues in the food environment include things like geographic access. So this is also just to, because have, have you guys talked about food insecurity yet? Globally, yeah. Global food insecurity. So Aneta, at a household level, food insecurity is, of course, a problem of inadequate household purchasing power, so you don't have enough money to buy the foods that you want to buy in a, in a culturally accessible, acceptable way. Um, this is about assuming people have enough money to buy the foods that they think they want to buy. <coughs> Things like geographic access. So this is a picture in uh, downtown St. John's in Newfoundland, um, looking at the kinds of geographic access and thinking about how can you access places. Do you have to drive there? Can you take transit? Can you walk? If you're in a wheelchair, what does that look like? Or um, in, in, the, in the snowy climates, etc. Things like availability. So once you get to the grocery store, or the convenience store, or wherever you're buying food, what kinds of foods are available? So is it, you know, this beautiful, be beautiful boxes of fresh produce, or does it look more like this? Because this will influence what you're, what you're buying. There's also affordability, so not just the absolute affordability of whether or not I can afford to feed my family in four on a limited income, but also what is the cost of certain products relative to the healthier options of those products. So what is the cost of whole wheat bread rel relative to white bread, or um, low sugar cereal relative to higher sugar cereal, or high salt products versus lower salt products. So it's those things within your environment that you may not even be aware of that will influence whether you choose one option or, or another. And theoretically, when we think about what, what are we even talking about, why, why do you care about food environments, there's some, this is sort of a theoretic, theoretical or conceptual chain. So the re, there's some aspect of the retail food environment that gives cues to consumers to buy one food or, over another. Then the consumers interpret these cues, take them in, purchase foods based in part on those cues, then they consume those foods that they've purchased, although much of that also goes to waste. And then there's diet-related NCDs or non-communicable diseases as well at the end of the day, after a lifetime of consuming a spe specific dietary pattern. So that's kind of like overall, this is like the links that we think link retail food environments to non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases at the end of the day. And food, of course, is very highly linked to many different kinds of um, chronic diseases including obesity, heart disease, tooth decay, diabetes, types of cancers, you name it, the things that are killing most of the people in Canada are related to diet. In 2015, earlier in 2015, there's a series, um, an obesity series in the Lancet, the journal, that said today's food environments exploit people's biological, psychological, social, and economic vulnerabilities, making it easier for them to eat unhealthy food. So in other words, it, in Canada, so here's a little fun, fun pop quiz. What proportion of Canadians do you think eat a healthy diet defined as one that adheres to Canada's Food Guide for Healthy Eating? This is based on 2004 data from the Canadian Community Health Survey. It's a little bit old. What proportion do you think have a healthy diet in Canada? How many people in this class would say, I eat a healthy diet? <laughs> okay, so like maybe half people were, and most people were like, eh. Okay, what proportion of Canadians do you think eat a healthy diet? Yeah? Uh, 40%. 40%. Anyone? Yeah? 10%. 10%. Anyone else? Yeah? I'll say 20%. 20%. Yeah. 
20 percent? Yeah. Okay, you're the warmest. Lower. <laughs> Zero point five percent. Right? It's it's actually so that's and people sometimes criticize the measure that they use, but it's a very comprehensive <coughs> measure of diet quality in Canada. Zero point five percent of people eat a healthy diet in Canada, according to two thousand four stats. We're going to be able to relook at that number um, because just in twenty fifteen the government went back and did another version of the same survey with twenty four hour diet. So it's really low, even though about 75% of us think that we have a healthy diet. If you ask people, how many of us, how many do you eat a healthy diet? Most people say, yes, I do. Can you say anything about the, like, what were the main points there that would have brought down people who, like myself who think that they have a pretty healthy diet? Yeah, so um, the, the score itself, I don't know the, how the different components of the score like which ones brought it down the most, but it was based on adequacy in terms of fruit and vegetable intake, whole grains, green and uh, dark green and orange vegetables, moderate sodium intake, so you couldn't surpass sodium intake. I don't think sugar was in there, saturated fat was in there. Um, yeah, so it was like adequacy according to the food groups, and then also some of the, the other foods had to be less than a specific amount. Yeah, I know. Fun fact, you can talk about it at your next family dinner. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so how would that have been reported, though? Like, is that self-reported? So it is self-reported. So it's it's 24-hour diet recalls, which is sort of the gold standard way of assessing diet, other than doubly labeled water, which assesses energy intake. But that's like, other than the biometric measures, where you're like taking people's urine and blood, um, it's the best way of assessing at a population level micronutrient data intake. So basically, it's called the triple pass method, and they did it um, in 2004 over the phone. Um, so it's basically you ask people, okay, what did you eat yesterday? In the last 24-hour period, what did you eat? And then you go back and you say, okay, well, I had oatmeal in the morning, and I had this, and I had that. And then they'll go back and say, so it's called the triple pass method because they go back three times over it. So the first one is just generally, what did you eat? Okay, next time, and did you have milk in your oatmeal? And did you put sugar in it? And then did you put cream in your coffee? And did you have butter or margarine on your sandwich and like that kind of stuff? And then the next time they go back, um, I think it's like amounts of stuff. So did, how much milk did you put in your oatmeal and that kind of thing? So it's it's the best that we have, even though you can imagine like people don't necessarily try to lie, but they do, or they forget about things. Like if you just pop a one of those little Halloween candy bars in your mouth, you may or may not remember that, right? So there's specific probes to say like. And did you do this thing that most people forget about? And so, yeah, the best we have, but still not perfect. Okay, so what is a community nutrition environment? This is what the community nutrition environment in Waterloo Region looks like. So all of these little burger and flies, <laughs> fries places are uh, accessible food outlets. They're not all fast food outlets. So they could be grocery stores, convenience stores, um, pharmacies, uh, etc. And then over layered, over top of that layered on is um, the walkability index. So what you see Waterloo and Kitchener here, and you can see that there's some correlation between the accessible food premises but, and walkability, but not entirely. There's kind of food distributed fairly evenly, especially along different transit corridors um, of the region of Waterloo. So when I talk about the community nutrition environment, it's the geographic accessibility to food. So this is a map of where food is in the region of Waterloo. <coughs> There's specific measures of the community nutrition environment, um, like that use GIS methods to um, provide data on, for example, proximity. So in this is um, some work that I did for my PhD in 2010, the New Path study, which was I assessed the, all the food outlets in the region. And we found that on average, people in the region of Waterloo live about 520 meters from the nearest convenience store, 1,000 meters from the nearest grocery store, and 582 meters from the nearest fast food outlet. So you can see that people are almost twice as close to the nearest convenience store and fast food outlet as they are to the nearest grocery store, which tend to have better availability and prices of fresh fruit and vegetables. Another way of thinking about it this is called the, the Retail Food Environment Index. So this is an index of looking at the overall mix of, or of uh, food outlets in an area. 
So we found that five, there's 5.6 times as many convenience stores and fast food outlets as there were grocery stores and specialty stores within one kilometer of people's homes on average. In, so just to go back, so this is what is characterized as a food swamp. So how many people have heard of food deserts? Have you heard of this concept? Food deserts. Okay, so everyone knows about food deserts, especially people like yourselves who are interested in food systems. Food deserts are um, low, often considered to be low-income or deprived areas without adequate access to a grocery store. We have good access to grocery stores, farmers markets, sources of affordable fresh produce in Kitchener, Cambridge, and Waterloo. On the other hand, we have so much more access, geographic access, to things like convenience stores and fast food outlets that the actual sort of area can be considered a food swamp, which is, again, often um, lower income areas that have way more access to unhealthy food sources, irrespective of access to healthy food sources. So the reason that this is important, that this distinction is important, is because if, you, if someone were to come to you and you were a regional councillor or a municipal councillor and say, we have food deserts in our city, how would you fix that? How would you fix a food desert? Someone says, we don't have, these poor areas have no grocery store in them. What could you do to solve that problem? Yeah? Build a grocery store. Build a grocery store. Put a grocery store in that neighborhood. On the other hand, if someone comes to you and says, we have food swamps in our problem, this is in our city, this is a real problem in these lower income areas or maybe around schools, they can walk to 12 fast food outlets at lunchtime, the kids at these schools. Then what's the, sol when, then what's the solution? Yeah? Well, it becomes a lot harder to regulate that. It does. It becomes harder to regulate that. But also, the, the actual solution in your ideal world, if you were, not necessarily an ideal world, but if you were in control of everything, you could do anything you wanted, what would be the solution to a food swamp? Yeah? Take some of them out? Yeah, take them out. Or say, pl pass land use planning policies that say, there's no more fast food outlets that are going to open within 800 meters of school. <laughs> or, we're going to do this program where you can become a healthy corner store and you're going to be certified and you're going to do this and that meet these requirements for supplying you know, in this neighborhood, etc. But people don't like those kinds of policies because they cry and scream and say, no, we can make our own choices because everyone believes that we're robots when it comes to making food choices. This is Toronto, a map of Toronto. So this is the healthfulness of food retail and the lower income areas. So this is the same similar kind of retail food environment index. So the darker red areas are places where um, it's uh, the worst food environments and the blue outlined areas are the places where it's neighborhoods that are in the lowest income quintile. So you can see in Toronto if there was a food desert problem you would expect to see all of the blue outlines around all of the dark red um, like the crappy food environments. That's not what you see. And in Toronto, actually, the food desert problem doesn't really exist to a great extent because throughout the city, people have good or bad access, but it doesn't seem to be related to people's income, which is important. So in Toronto, putting a grocery store in, in poor neighborhoods may probably won't solve anything. So the other thing to think about when you're thinking about community nutrition environments, in addition to sort of where things are in your neighborhood or in your city, is how do people get there? And so this is somewhere that when I am starting now in the School of Planning that I'm hoping to address in my future research, is what can planners do to plan cities better so that food access is a sort of daily requirement that can be better considered in developing cities. So this is a... a um, neighborhood Lotharton Pathway in Toronto that we've done some work with, with the Toronto Food Strategy people. And the closest discount grocery store is 2.5 kilometers away. So this is um, low income housing in Toronto and this is what the neighborhood looks like. So if you are, and transit is okay, it's not great to get to the grocery store. And most of the people in these apartment towers do not have access to a private vehicle because they don't have enough money. So what would you do if you lived in here? How would you access food for your family? What people here have done is they've, so I should also explain, here, this is the grocery stores this way, and this is the railroad tracks. And so people here 
have decided to create their own sort of desire path, ways that they want to get around a built environment to go and procure retail opportunities, including food, at the discount grocery store. So they're climbing over the big fence around their building and going over the railroad track so they can walk to the grocery store. Then going over to a very small community, in this is uh, on the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland, this arrow is pointing to a little place where we're also doing some work, Healthy Corner Stores work in Branch, Newfoundland. And this is uh, Kareen's Gas Bar and they are, we're working with them to figure out whether we can make healthier foods available and still financially rewarding for the retailer. The closest supermarket here is 62.5 kilometers away. And so you can imagine, if you didn't have access to a car, you would, I don't know why you'd be living in this area, because you kind of need a car to get around. Or you need to have friends who have cars to, to drive you places. But typically, people in these kinds of settings, the, the access, the geographic access, is a lot different. So poor access in Toronto, we might consider to be 2.5 kilometers. Poor access in rural and remote parts of Canada might be even 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers away from the nearest full-service grocery store. So people here in this community typically will go to Kareen's, um, you know, on a daily, day-to-day -day basis, and then once a week go to St. John's and go to the Costco and stock up on stuff. So the next, so that's the community nutrition environments, thinking about where things are in relation to where the people are, how you get there, how you access these places. Consumer, nu consumer nutrition environments, on the other hand, is also known as in-store marketing. So once you arrive at your food outlet, what things are being marketed to you in your environment? Has anyone seen this kind of map before? Okay, so this is a map of a typical grocery store layout. And often you can go to um, different public health units and they'll have a dietitian who can take you on a grocery store tour and teach you how to shop in the grocery store. And what they'll typically say is, Stick to the perimeter of the grocery store because that's where most of the healthy food is. Only go down that center aisles um, to shop for healthy things like high protein cereal, nut butters, canned beans, and tomatoes, and dried fruit. But don't go in there to just hang out <laughs> because if you do, you're going to end up with a cart full of junk. So, like, if you think about any grocery store that you go to, pretty much this whole aisle is pop. Pretty much this whole aisle is salty snacks. Maybe part of it is sugary snacks at the end, right? There's like kids' lunch aisles that are ridiculously long. They're, they're feet and feet and feet long. So this is why they say don't, don't, uh, don't hang out in this area. Also, next time you're in the grocery store, please notice end cap displays. So uh, grocery stores, these carts here, you can move uh, a product from like here to here and you could like double its sales if you wanted to. There's also these, all these little, you know the hanging things? When you go through your grocery store aisle, notice what's hanging in the middle of like the canned bean aisle. It's not bananas, I'll tell you that much. It's like meat, dried meat, or mostly chocolate, or other kinds of candies that they're trying to target you to get impulse buys. And the, there's tons of consumer and psychological research that go into setting up grocery stores that is so fun and so amazing. Um, there's, so I'll just give you a couple of examples that really were kind of like, ah, to me when I found out of them. In the uh, vegetable section, you can increase sales of scallions or green onions by like 15% just by changing them from the side position to this position where the little white parts are sticking out so that the consumers see the white part. And somehow that makes their sales increase by like 15%. <laughs> Who knew, right? But they do know, and they are very good. And by they, I mean like the grocery industry is very, very good at making money by uh, marketing very cleverly to people within the grocery store. Here's my friend. So this is my friend Kathy Ma. We do a lot of work together. And our friend Brian and Kathy's husband Guy. This is in St. John's. We were there for a workshop uh, in the community. And this was extending like all the way down. This is a superstore in uh, St. John's. All the way down the aisle. Here's the cash registers all here. So basically, after you've gone through the whole grocery store and used up all your willpower to say, no, I'm not going to get that, I'm not going to get that, I'm not going to get that, 
They have one last kick the, kick at the can of marketing junk to you as you're in your way, on your way to the cash register to check out. Here's another example. Where is this? Does anyone know? It's here in town. Yeah. Dutchies. Dutchies. Here's, so I took this picture because I was like, oh, interesting that they're the last sort of impulse buys at Dutchies that you can make before you get into the cash is boxes of mandarins or bags of onions or potatoes. For those of you who know, when my, when my partner saw this, he was like, yeah, you've cleverly left out, you conveniently left out like all the candies that they also have there. But I did conveniently leave it out because I wanted to show what I wanted to show. <laughs> so here's, here's another uh, way of, of thinking about the food environment. What would happen if other stores tried this instead of marketing junk at the, at the cash? Here's, this is while, while I was waiting in an airport one time, I saw this Pepsi vending machine, which are also everywhere, although University of Waterloo is a Coke campus, not Pepsi, um, so you won't see any Pepsi on this campus. You can see here's regular vending machine, right? Oh, a calories count. So Pepsi really cares about your health and your beverage choices because as you can see, all of the calorie labels are clearly showing, which they're actually not, and I looked. And then you get this little tiny ad here, oh, eat the right thing. And then you have to buy it, and then you'll feel good about your decision for not choosing tons of sugar. So when I think about public health nutrition messaging, which is basically and you guys, you guys all know this, it's so deeply ingrained in your psyches, I'm sure, from the time you were little kids. Eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more fiber, eat less fat, eat less sugar, eat less salt, eat less processed foods, etc. We're telling people this, and we're so good at telling people all the time what they should and shouldn't eat, even though a lot of people disagree about that still, so it's confusing. But in general, I think, yeah, fresh better than processed, fruits and veg better than meat, Okay, like people typically sort of know that kind of stuff. But when I, when I think about what we're actually doing in public health messaging, we're saying we want you to go from this star here to this star up here on this road, but don't turn at all. It has to be, you have to walk in a straight line from there to there. So we're telling people something that might be possible. Like maybe it's possible, but if you have some sort of restraints around your mobility, if you have to be in a car to be safe, you actually have to like turn, right? So I think the messaging we're giving people is not realistic in terms of what is, or what our food environment is sort of leading us to, um, to purchase and to consume. Okay, so how do we, when, you th when we think about how to change the, the food environment, these are a few different kinds of interventions that can be adopted by cities, by NGOs, by um, researchers by whomever is interested in changing the, the food environment. So the first one is changing the environment, the second one is changing the retailer, and the third one is to support the consumer. So under change the environment, there's things that, that cities can do to change the environment in which residents find themselves. So they can do things like permitting temporary farmers market. And in regional Waterloo they've done a lot of work on what it looks like in getting the, the zoning and the permits to, to permit um, temporary farmers markets. There's things that, that cities have done, mostly in the US, to incentivize grocery stores to open in lower income underserved areas. Mobile good food vending is another one. So we did some work in Toronto with the food strategy people and we looked at low income neighborhoods and what happens to their diet and food security if you bring in, um, this one was in a, in a neighborhood that had a high proportion of senior residents and a lot of people didn't drive. And so we brought healthy food to them, and we used this mobile good food vending, an old truck that we had converted into uh, a, this beautiful um, vehicle that could su supply fresh fruits and vegetables. And then there's things like zoning restrictions. So some uh, municipalities in Canada are actually considering what it would look like to create zoning regulations that would prohibit the land use of things like convenience stores or fast food outlets around schools. Then there's um, changing the retailer. So how can you actually work with existing? It's basically like retrofitting the food environment. Working with, with owners to create healthy corner stores. There's nudging. Um, so you can look at how to nudge people, like putting the green onions the pretty way with the little white things facing outwards. Um, that will help to increase people's food purchasing of, of um, 
the kinds of foods that you think would be good for people to eat from a public health perspective. And then there's also menu labeling. So interestingly, uh, there's some legislation tabled in Ontario right now to put menu labels on chain restaurants. One of the very, very interesting things to me is that it may or may not do anything to people's actual food purchasing and, and consumption decisions in the, in the actual restaurant because people don't go to McDonald's to eat a healthy meal, typically. They go there because they want a Big Mac or because they want something else that they sell. But what menu labeling policies do is they force the food industry to reformulate their products so they look better when you're when you have to tell people how much sodium is in your french fries you reformulate them so it looks so there's less sodium in them so you don't have to be like oh yeah by the way if you eat this thing of french fries that's this big you're gonna not need any more salt for the rest of your life there's also supporting the consumer so things like mobile apps so how do you um, everyone carries a cell phone now anyway so how can you use those to help people navigate their food environments in a way that's supportive of health and then there's things like grocery store education uh, like I said before about dietitian tours of grocery stores and in-store recipes and food, uh, food skills training. So going with people and teaching them how to cook in stores. So what works of all of these different types of interventions that change the food environment? The first thing that I want to point out is that, again, I'm coming at this from a public health angle. When I think about what works, I think about, well, something that works fixes the way people eat. It changes the way that they eat. It changes, it improves their diet quality overall. But if you ask a business improvement area what works for a retail food inter intervention, they'll have a different answer. They'll say something that is a financially viable business is the thing that works for us. Local producers will say something that allows us to profile our products and grow more of them or grow more of them in a sustainable way, that's what works. Local retailers will say something that will drive consumers to come into my business and buy more stuff. That's what works. Youth groups and health groups and distributors, seniors groups, economic development people. These are all <coughs> different stakeholders in this arena of retail food environment interventions that have different opinions. When you ask them their opinion about what, do, what is a food retail intervention that works, they'll all have different answers. And so one of my big learnings over the last few years is that my answer is health. My answer is let's increase healthy diets. But that's not everyone's answer. And my answer is not necessarily any more important than other people's answers about developing the local economy.